After the fall of the Western Roman Empire, Europe divided and communication beyond its borders and among its peoples largely disintegrated. Historical time was frozen and a great step backward in all areas of knowledge occurred. In spite of this, the ideal of a united Europe, emulating the time of the Empire, persisted. And in the 12th and 13th centuries, with its God-centered and closed view of the world, the Middle Ages began to show symptoms of exhaustion. Now, there were the first signs of opening up, and the horizon began to widen. Ancient knowledge was rediscovered. The Muslim world, with its much more advanced civilization, had preserved and developed the knowledge of the classical and Alexandrian world, incorporating elements from the Chaldean and Egyptian cultures. Supported by their culture-loving kings, places like Toledo and Sicily, with their multicultural relationships and exchanges, developed the art of translation. Muslims, Jews and Christians lived together in these places and through their efforts and their work in common turned them into points of entry for and dissemination of knowledge gathered until then. These cultural recovery phenomena are the forerunners of the Renaissance and when the Middle Ages came to a close the search for new horizons began in Europe. During the 15th century, and particularly after the fall of Constantinople, Byzantine scholars took Greek literature to Florence, where it was translated. The classical world was rediscovered in its full splendor. Art, philosophy, science, the organization and values of Greece and Rome became models in all the fields. And together with the scholars and the texts, the ancient myths and religions arrived. The 16th century was already heralding a change of epoch. New research, travels and discoveries had brought new information to the world, which did not fit into the axioms inherited from antiquity. Intellectuals and artists attempted not only to imitate the classical masters, but also to set the ground for a new stage. At Charles V's abdication in 1556, his empire was split. His son Philip II would reign over Spain, the Low Countries and the domains of the Catholic King and Queen. His brother Ferdinand would hold the eastern part of the House of Austria and from 1558 he would be the emperor of the Germanic Holy Roman Empire. Charles hoped that at Ferdinand's death, both parts of the crown would become united. Ferdinand's successor in the empire was finally his son Maximilian. Philip II accepted this on condition that the archdukes Rudolf and Ernest, sons of his sister Mary and of Maximilian, travelled to Spain to receive an adequate Catholic religious education. This was because Maximilian's Roman orthodoxy was held in doubt. Rudolf was actually educated in Spain from his 11th year to his 19th year, so in the most formative period of his education he lived at the Spanish court. Um, he was of course the heir to the uh, Austrian Habsburg lands um, and he was due to become Holy Roman Emperor. Um, his uncle, Philip II, made very sure that he was uh, heavily influenced by the Spanish branch of his family. Uh, subsequently, that relationship was not all that smooth. Um, for example, Rudolf steadfastly refused to marry, although he was supposed to marry his cousin, the Spanish Infanta, um, and that must have something to do with, uh, psychologically, with a sense of being repressed, perhaps dominated by the Spanish influence later on. But while he was a youth, he seems to have um, responded um, perfectly, uh, perfectly uh, soundly to 
the uh, Spanish influence at the court uh, in Madrid, uh, the early years of Escorial and so on, and the kinds of figure like Herrera who were influential in the court of Philip. There are some ways in which we might say uh, the mentality of Rudolf is quite close to that of Philip, um, and that's not by accident. Um, but equally, there are ways in which they became markedly different in terms of religious toleration. Uh, we shall find that Rudolf took a different line from Philip. Um, the trouble is we know very little about uh, the ways in which he was actually educated. We just have the names of a few pedagogues, a few teachers uh, who were with him in Spain. Um, but apart from that, we can only surmise that the kind of books which would have been in the Royal Library uh, of Philip uh, and the kind of books which he later, Rudolf, had in his own collections, uh, that he would have been reading those. What's perfectly clear, though, uh, is that the kind of interests uh, which were manifested, the grandeur of Spain, um, in that period, uh, the very cosmopolitan range of Spanish influences uh, from uh, Western Europe across to the Americas and through the Mediterranean. In 1571, Rudolf returned to Maximilian's court and was crowned. First as the King of Hungary and Bohemia, and later as the Emperor of the Germanic Holy Roman Empire. Because of the type of organization within the empire, his powers and room for maneuver were limited. From the beginning, he had to face the religious confrontation between Catholics and various Protestant denominations. More interested in the arts and the sciences than in religious wars, Rudolf II left Vienna and settled in Prague in 1582. Když se ptáme, proč Rudolf zvolil Prahu za své sílo, proč vlastně... We may ask ourselves why Rudolf II chose Prague as his residence. Why, unlike his father, Maximilian II, had he not lived in Vienna? There is, in fact, more than one reason for this. The first reason was to continue with Fernand II of Tyrolean's court tradition who chose Prague as residence during the years 1548 and 1565. The second reason, that Prague was under the Turks' permanent threat. Above all, Prague was six times larger than Vienna. Being a city built in such a marvelous way by Charles IV, it was and still is a beautiful city. It was evident that Rudolf II liked Prague and its hunting facilities with its great number of hunting castles surrounding the city. It is well known that Rudolf frequently visited Brandy's castle. Prague fascinated and enchanted him with its surroundings and at the same time the extensive castle area which was being rebuilt and modernized gave him the opportunity to be at the center of European events and have enough space for his privacy and access to his scientists, artists and architects. Prague, at the time of Rudolf II, was living through one of its golden periods. It was a frontier town, the heart of Europe, the seat of different cultures. As a result of this, Prague was chronically undergoing great effervescence and instability. Cultural phenomena had expanded and even became distorted as if in a curved mirror. On the other hand, it has been said that the Republic of Letters was something that continued functioning and that the epistolary communication systems were very important during the 16th century, whereby scholars wrote extensively to each other in a very open manner, a way we're far from conceiving even now. Today, no one could possibly write the extraordinary epistolary collections that were written during the 16th century. They were a means of communication, communication of ideas, and not until there was a partner's institution in the 17th century, the mechanisms remained irregular. The epistolary system, the printing press, and other methods we have mentioned here, 
travel. I mean to say there was movement of scholars, a constant academic migration. People did not normally teach at a single university and they would not remain forever in any of them, choosing to journey through various universities. A scholar would lecture at one place for a few years and afterwards move on to another. They were asked to give some lectures and then go away, perhaps to return later on. So therefore we can see movement within the intellectual world, perhaps greater than one might expect. As in Rudolf II's court, so Maximilian II, who kept a good part of his father's dominions, witnessed a growing elite of historians, antiquarians, collectors, specialists in botany and minerals. New and old books were published. Rudolf II and many members of his court accumulated a treasure of great libraries, in addition to the ones already existing in monasteries such as Strakhov. There was a fascination with accounts of travels, which included topographical, ethnological and archaeological descriptions. A large number of inventions and mechanical devices were produced. Alchemists developed pharmacy and mineralogy. The observation of heavenly bodies and the detailed understanding of their movements made great historical strides forward. The Prague court was often visited by figures such as John Dee, astrologer of the Elizabethan court and a Christian Kabbalist, or by Giordano Bruno, philosopher and disseminator of the Hermetic tradition. The various intellectual and artistic disciplines, which related to the religious or mystical trends, referred to the same philosophical background and concept of the world that gave birth to the European Renaissance. Each element that is studied exists as part of a whole and within a harmonic order. A system of relationships links heavenly bodies, plants, minerals, medicines and colours. Likewise, the different parts of the human being were thought of as a microcosm. An intimate understanding of reality cannot be reached without the guidance of some inner light. This intuitive way of approaching the underlying reality of perceivable phenomena blends the figures of the scholar, the magician and the artist. The urge to gather all known wisdom went hand in hand with the various attempts to reorganize or synthesize knowledge in general. But in order to provide a ground for such synthesis, a substantial supporting truth is necessary. Such truth was kept hidden. The collections of art and rare objects, or objects with special meaning, as well as alchemy and astrology, were Rudolf II's main interest. All kinds of experiments took place in Prague Castle, and Rudolf got directly involved in many activities, from handicrafts to those of an occult character. Some of his close collaborators, such as Hayek, his advisor in these matters, or Michael Meyer, were court alchemists and physicians. As for the alchemy, it was a strange case. At that time, alchemy was not only about producing the philosopher's stone or the elixir of life. It was something more. It was about practical experiments that were important and meaningful. It was quite interesting that before being allowed to work at Rudolf's court, one had to pass some examinations. Not everyone who came was hired. There were more charlatans at Rosenberg's court 
uh, then at Rudolf II, because he was a practitioner and educated, so it was hard to cheat him. This relationship is very important. The relationship between chemistry and alchemy is similar to the relationship between astronomy and astrology. These are two sides of one coin. It is necessary to understand that alchemy and chemistry at the time were as one, where the research aspect of the matter had its own value. The spiritual aspect has been discovered recently because it is sometimes hidden in a complicated explanation of processing things. Many of those paranormal phenomena are presently considered a bit differently than in the past. The observation of nature and experimentation gained new intensity. Anatomical studies were made, collections, gardens and zoos, plus the books on botany and zoology, show an intention to unify the diversity of all the manifestations of life. Prague's Jewish community was a large and prosperous one, with intellectual figures of great prestige in the world of the Jewish Kabbalistic tradition. Such was Rabbi Loe, who was associated with the Golem legend of a living being created from mud. This legend and other searches, such as the one for the elixir of youth and the diverse and extensive research of natural phenomena, speak to us of the birth of an interest in understanding the secret of life, how to give life to the inanimate. It is the attempt to discover that which remains hidden inside the human being and in nature, what imparts life and what drives it. Rudolf managed to attract to his court the famous astronomer Tycho Brahe. His discoveries, through the observation of stars and comets, put an end to the Aristotelian conception of an eternally invariable firmament. Tycho Brahe's great contribution was the accuracy of his measurements, which he systematically accumulated over many years and for which he invented and built new instruments. Soon after settling in Prague, Tycho offered a job to Kepler, who was then suffering persecution for being a Protestant. Kepler had already adopted the then revolutionary Copernican model, advocating the orbit of the planets around the Sun. Using Tycho Brahe's measurements, he developed the formulae that define the motion of the planets. The three Kepler laws and Newton's later explanation of the law of universal gravity laid the basis for modern cosmology. Moreover, Kepler's ideas and aims are in tune with Renaissance Neoplatonism. In his research, he tried to understand the work of the Creator who must necessarily have started from the pure geometrical forms to express his laws in a mathematically harmonious world. I can wait a hundred years for a reader, since God has waited six thousand for a witness. In the field of art, Rudolf II's role as a patron went beyond economic funding. He invited, encouraged, praised, directed, and even conferred titles on various artists. On the artistic side, uh, and Rudolf um, patronized all forms of the arts, um, well there it's interesting to note that the, uh, those who actually lived at Rudolf's court, who he was able to tempt uh, and who spent their careers there, are on the whole not the most famous artists, even of their own day, although uh, one of them, Giuseppe Arcimboldo, has become very uh, noted uh, in um, recent years as being, some people would say, the first surrealist. 
particularly with these extraordinarily composed heads which he created uh, out of um, objects from the natural world which just look like uh, a particular person and one or two of them were made to look like Rudolf himself. So Archimboldo and others like Spranger and von, von Aachen um, are considerable uh, painters um, and then there are um, major um, sculptors uh, and, 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 and so on uh, at, at the court. But on the whole, Rudolf had to overcome the, uh, the fact that his own artistic school, if significant, was not um, of such lasting importance by creating a collection which brought together the works of artists, living and dead, um, who really could stand as the most central and important um, collection of, of its day. So he was celebrated in his time for bringing together the works of artists like Dürer and uh, Brokel, that's Peter Brokel the Elder, um, and uh, of the great Renaissance artists in, in, in Italy, um, so Veronese and Titian and so on. Um, and not just the painters, but uh, a great range of artifacts, sculptures and works of applied art. And in some ways it was the applied art at Rudolf's court that was the most striking of all. Some of it created in local materials like bohemian glass. Um, some of the uh, most remarkable creations of the day uh, were brought together in Rudolf's collections. Um, and these did duty, as it were, for the uh, artists themselves, who might uh, be absent, um, and allowed him, and this is very interesting about the collections, we don't fully understand the mentality of those who collected in the Renaissance period, but we do have a sense that they were seeking in their collections, if they had the money um, and the scope to create them, they were seeking to bring together this world, this fractured universe, which they were trying to maintain as a single whole and to understand. Uh, so they did attribute particular virtues and properties to a good deal of the material they had present in their collections. And that explains why they were keen to acquire for their collections not only the works, as we would say, of um, celebrated um, artists, the artifacts of that kind, um, but natural objects, perhaps uh, works um, created from natural objects. Although nominally a Catholic, Rudolf II did not take part in religious persecutions. He allowed a denominational plurality which went against the religious monolithic trend being forced on the great European nations. To, co se můžeme od toho rudolfínského fenoménu naučit, je myslím si, že je to především ta velká míra tolerance. Protože to je něco, co pro Rudolfa bylo What we can learn from the Rudolfian phenomenon is especially the high degree of tolerance. It was immensely characteristic for Rudolf. He did not mind whether people were Catholic, Protestant, Adamite, Calvinist. If they had one or two legs. Fundamental for him was whether a man could do anything and could excel at it. So the diverse society that represented the best in Europe, regardless of political, national or religious affiliation, could meet in Prague. Rudolf also had the ability to keep a balance among individual groups which formed that society. His seemingly negative approach to problem solving was in fact an intentional delay in decision making so that he did not have to agree with somebody and so disturb the balance. In my opinion, it was the most significant quality of Rudolf's government. When Matthias, who was noticeable Catholic orientated, disturbed that balance and that pursuit of tolerance, Europe collapsed into the tragedy of the Thirty Years' War. Jaksi výrazně katolicky orientovaný tuhle rovnováhu a tu snahu o, o snášenlivost porušil, tak se Evropa teda zhroutila 
do, do toho neštěstí 30 letý války. This was a time notable for its changeable and convulsive religious atmosphere. You could sense the change of epoch. Apocalyptic prophecies got ample diffusion, but there was also a belief in an imminent arrival of a new era of peace and prosperity, rooted in a spiritually reformed human being. Neo-Platonicers like Bruno referred to a natural religion that preceded Christianity and that is believed to go back to ancient Egypt and from which all the greater Western and Middle Eastern religions derive. Others looked into the Kabbalah for the essential meaning of biblical revelation. By going back to an earlier and rooted truth, these formulations created the basis for solving religious confrontations. Christian ecumenism and humanism with its cosmopolitan and tolerant character were moving in the same reconciling direction. But these tendencies did not materialize into a force capable of overcoming circumstances. The abandonment of the sacraments and the many visits of magicians and alchemists, plus Rudolf's increasing absence from public life, gave rise to the rumor that he was possessed by demons, and this spread among the Catholics. Rudolf progressively lost power. In 1608, his brother Matthias took over Austria, Hungary and Moravia. Rome and Spain gave approval to his military advances. The Protestant side obtained the Majesty Chart from Rudolf II, which allowed a free choice of religious practice. In 1611, Matthias entered Prague in triumph, and Rudolf, forced to abdicate, remained in the castle as a recluse until his death in 1612. In 1618, after failing to comply with the Majesty Chart, he was ousted and this gave rise to the Thirty Year War that devastated the center of Europe. Praga, que, Gran Praga, que dura muy poco, ¿no? porque mil, en 1620 se produce la batalla de Vilajora, es decir, la batalla de la montaña, de la montaña blanca. Y... Grand Prague did not last very long, due to the Battle of Vilajora, which took place in 1620. By the year 1648, the last year of the Third Year War, the extensive looting had become another serious blow for the city. Prague would not be what it had been under Rudolf II's reign until much later. Furthermore, the king's collections had become totally dispersed. Even today, many of the items in the original collections have not yet been recovered. Be it a precious book, such as the Codex Argentus, marvelous works of art, paintings and so forth, gold and silver pieces, are still spread over the four cardinal points and can be found in many major museums all over the world. It was clear in that sense the Czechs had obviously seen the highlight of Prague's splendor coinciding with Rudolf II's reign. After his death came very hard times for the city. Prague met a true Iron Age, an age of calamity. But uh, in many other ways, um, Rudolf's court might seem to be the end of an era. It's the end of the Renaissance. It's an end uh, of the um, belief that classical learning, as uh, transmitted through humanism, in fact was sufficient for understanding the world. It's an end, of course, of the kind of religious toleration which uh, Rudolf had stood for um, in favor of state religions which for a century and more uh, afterwards were profoundly intolerant 
of other kinds of faith. So free thinking uh, in many ways becomes uh, more difficult. In all these sorts of ways we would say that there is a caesura, a break, uh, after Rudolf and that what happens in the 17th and through into the 18th centuries is different. And of course, occult sciences are increasingly viewed with disfavour uh, and uh, gradually they're associated with an old world view um, which uh, doesn't seem to be compatible and for quite a long time didn't seem to be compatible with ideas of enlightenment and then ideas of rationalism as they were understood in the 18th and 19th centuries. Only the 20th century has come back to a fuller recognition that perhaps um, occult understandings of the world around us are a part uh, of any true understanding of the world. So one might say that there is a very substantial break uh, but also one might say that there are features of uh, the court of Rudolf which look forward across that break to more modern times. Of course we have subsequently come to value the toleration of the 16th century where it survived as in Prague uh, much more highly uh, and we recognize that there are features of the progressive thinking as we might say of Rudolf's court which are picked up only much later as with some of the uh, artistic uh, creativity and as with some of the ideas um, which uh, are associated with uh, the uh, more uh, radical, uh, more unorthodox features of court life under Rudolf. The modern age set out on the path of rationalism and naturalism and led to a complete divorce of faith from reason, of knowledge from existence, and of the sciences and technology on the one hand, from the arts and humanities on the other, creating an incongruous mix. To this we have to add geographical fragmentation, plus an abandoning of Latin as the common language for cultural exchanges, because knowledge developed more within national areas and in vernacular languages. Having assumed positions of power, official science and religion progressively relegated other conceptions of the world to marginality, gradually deleting any traces of them. Compared with the reigns of the other kings of that epoch, the Rudolphian world has been largely ignored. It has been hidden from history like the dark side of the moon. But if we are to understand our present day condition, we cannot ignore it.